Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help around the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope that what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's Positive Filter, a.k.a. Ill Phil, a.k.a. The Illus, a.k.a. Ghoul Hamilton, a.k.a. Uh, I got a tattoo, Austin, Texas, on my leg, a.k.a. The best person you'll ever meet. Uh, I don't know. I can't even think of a rhyme right now. But I'm the host of Positive Filter, and I have a special guest with me joining me on a very special episode because this is the first time we're testing new technology. We're going into the future. Uh, Would you like to introduce yourself, Brother Anthony Hyman? Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's good to be here on the podcast. I've been waiting my turn to come out here. I've heard about all of my other brothers getting an opportunity to flex on the podcast. I'm just glad to be here. So I'm Anthony Hyman, a.k.a. Gunston Teacher, a.k.a. Fall 93, a.k.a. You'll know it when I show it to you. There you go. A.k.a. Everyone needs to go to Africa and visit at least once in their life. I love that. I like that word. Yeah. All right. See, that's even better. You stunned it on us. So, Anthony, we, we're joined on the podcast, and usually with the podcast, I am joined by family and friends. You know, um, this podcast overall is about positivity and well-being and stuff, but with that being said, usually I just say, hey, you want to be on the podcast? And we think of a subject. And honestly, I was very surprised, not surprised, but, you know, when we first met, I thought I was very unique in my nerdom or blurdom, as they call it, black nerdom. And then just randomly, by happenstance, we found out we shared a love for, you know, special culture of science fiction. And then that's how we are on this podcast today. But you actually exposed me, like many new things I've learned over uh, New Year's and time, to a new sub, not subgenre, but a new genre of science fiction that was always in my face. But now I'm like really nerding out, like I really enjoy it or learning about it. Can you tell us that topic and how we kind of roundabout came to this? Sure. Well, I think everything that you're hinting to revolves around Afrofuturism. We kind of tossed around for a moment, but the idea of Afrofuturism or Afrofuturism, depending on how you want to say it, simply brings to mind the movie The Black Panther yeah. and the fictional place of Wakanda. So when I think of Afrofuturism, I think of what if Wakanda really existed? But giving you a more definitive definition, a little background, a guy named Mark Derry he mm. wrote an essay called Black to the Future back in 93. Okay. So he's the one that's credited with coining the term Afrofuturism. Yeah. But the dictionary describes it as a movement in literature, music, art, featuring futuristic or science fiction themes, which incorporate elements of black history and culture. Yes. So when I think about it, I think about all of those books that I would read when I was a kid. Um, I used to read Pierce Anthony novels. Okay. Which ones are those? They're old. Okay. But they're basically sci-fi fantasy novels where in you have protagonist that has to visit different worlds, go through different challenges, but basically it was just straight up science fiction. And during those times, I always wondered why they never really had any black people in them. Oh, his novels didn't have black people in them? Not to my knowledge. All sorts of creatures, but none that I actually identify with or recall. So when I think about Afrofuturism, I think about what would it be like for a person like myself to be in those sci-fi novels, to be in those sci-fi movies, to 
create the type of music that has existed with us. We just never really called it Afrofuturistic. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I think the thing that you brought up that, or when I started reading about it, that really brought it to light was that there's always been a culture of people, black people, really interested in science and math and and that pop culture of of you know fantasy but then that re- the main thing i said was that i heard from your your discussion was representation like i'm interested in that topic but i don't see people like me in the comic books as much or i mean they're in the comic books but like you said like they're not in the fantasy stuff but then more and more recently we're seeing that and, 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 and I'm saying, and, and it's been around like, you know, rappers, there used to be like future, like Missy, I'm thinking like Missy videos where she used to dress all different. Right. It was always in music. It was kind of different, like, and it, but it was, it was shown in a different way. Like, you know, like in music videos or, but it just wasn't per se in like sci-fi, if that makes sense. It, it does. And it's interesting that all of the music that I remember growing up listening to, for example, George Clinton mm-hmm. and Parliament, that was a type of Afro-futuristic music. We just thought that it sounded cool, but the messages that they were putting out there and mm-hmm. the sound that they created, that whole funk vibe is an example of a musical uh, type of Afrofuturism. Then you have artists like Sun Ra, who's really credited with bringing that music to the forefront back in the 70s. Then if you bring it a little more current, you had Miss Erica Badu. Yeah. Think about that album, Baduism. That just kind of changed the entire scape. And her videos kind of presented a different um, lens, if you will, of how to see ourselves that went along with her songs. And then one of the most current artists that I think represents that subculture is Janelle Monet. Okay. I was thinking like, yeah, Janelle Monet. Cause I was thinking that dude, Jendaya, but he kind of goes like in the past a little bit. Right. Like, Jena, you mean? J- yeah. The, you know, the, the, he like wears the real sharp suits, right? But it's more like he's past, but I do see what you're saying where she's kind of like, this futuristic, like non-binary, we dress different, the future is different yeah. kind of thing. She does put off that vibe. That arc Android, and I believe the yeah. Arc 30 computer. Yes. Right. And But I don't want to forget that group that did kind of really push the envelope, even though we thought it was a little weird, Outcast. Yeah. Outcast, uh, I don't know if you remember the album Aquamini. Yeah, it's my favorite. One yeah, of my favorites. That's one of my, my, um, my line brother right in front of me, number 11. I remember he used to bang that so much and talked about how great the album was. But just the themes that they put out there mm-hmm. and just the representation of the music that they gave represented Afrofuturism. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things I think of additionally with Afrofuturism is that it breaks down the stereotype. You said it perfectly about the nation, like Wakanda. And you said everyone should go to Africa at least once. Now, I've been to Africa... A long time ago, but I definitely want to go to another what's called pilgrimage. But I want to go to like Ghana and uh, and go to you know either Ghana or Nigeria and go to the major metropolitan areas okay. because I want to expose myself to break the stereotypes that have been ingrained through media that like you know everyone thinks jungle, jungle, jungle right. of Africa, but if you go to these large metropolitan areas. It, they, they are in the they're in the future they are in the future and um i remember when i was a kid i read this book called like the ear the eye and the arm or something like that and the main three characters it took place in africa mm-hmm. and it, it was in the future in africa and they were talking about like floating cars and all that stuff and i think the thing that attracts me to that genre so much is that it shows the technology and the innovation and creativity that is in that is in Africa, but it's kind of like contradictory to all the messages that we grew up. Right. If that makes sense. That makes sense. Like, like we grew up thinking like, you know, the jungles and all this stuff. And it's like, that's so ignorant 
to go back. There's businesses. There's huge metropolitan. I think Largos is like one of the top cities in the world with business. Right. No one thinks of that, you know, Not Largos. And we in the U.S. are subject, unfortunately, to the media that's presented in front of us. I remember growing up thinking that everyone in Africa was starving and mm -hmm. to give money to try to help them. But until I got older and I began to see people, meet people that were from Africa, did I know that it wasn't like that. And they themselves would say that the images that you think of us are no different than the images that are presented to us there. Yeah. So they think that some think that we're all rappers, we're all athletes. Yeah, there's a disconnect. There's, there's a there's a big disconnect, and I think that uh, you're right. Like you know, I think quite honestly, it, it, within college and meeting people from Africa in college. Usually, the smartest, brightest people are the were the kids that are first generation from Africa right. that came to America, and or and when I say first generation, maybe they're they born in America, but their parents came to, um, to America, right. and they are the smartest, brightest STEM kids I met. Like if you if if you look at any engineering program, which this is going to be a big stereotype, if it's a black person in engineering, I'm going to go with a strong, strong, strong uh, correlation that they are an African student. And I would agree with you. Like most of the kids at Mason, if they're the kids that are in um, Nesby, the black engineering group, they're from Ghana or Niger, Nigeria. So, I mean, that the culture, the STEM, the science, that it's it's in Africa, if that makes, you know. It is. And I think the thing that it pop culturally, the Afrofuturism genre, it breaks that down and connects Americans, black Americans to that world in Africa, but also it opens our minds to the creativity that can exist in those countries or right. exist in us. But it kind of like, I'm not saying fantasy, but you know, you, 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 you base a lot of what you can do in the future and not like say what you can do in the future, but like your dreams and like what you can do with technology, you base it off sci-fi, right? Right. Like you watch a sci-fi movie and you say, okay, what day are we going to have floating cars? Like eventually someday we're going to have floating cars. And we do. Oh yeah. We do have hoverboards. We do have, we have hover cars. We have hover crafts. So they don't go that far, but at high up the ground, far, but, but they're there. It does hover above ground. Yeah. Or the jetpacks. We've seen jetpacks. We know that they exist. Yeah. Or, um, I don't know, something else like transplant before, you know, you get an, you can get an organ and put it in someone else. These are all crazy things that or I can talk to someone through my watch. Yeah. Or we can have a full conversational video. We watched Back to the Future, and now we're doing it where you have video calls. Right. But I think the thing is that that pop culture, it introduces ideas and technology, right? That pop culture, movies, yeah. sci-fi. But now with Afrofuturism, it connects not only that pop culture part of what's possible, but it also has people like us doing that what's possible. Right. And that, I think for any kid or anything... That's even cooler because as a kid, you can be like, I could be the scientist that makes the hover car, or I could be the scientist that um, is going to invent, you know, the the robotic arm that looks like I see on some anime movie where the dude has a real arm, and it is his arm got cut off, but he's got a robot arm that works just as well as a normal arm, right? Because they see it in a comic book. Absolutely, and that's one of. The, the great things about Afrofuturism is it gives hope. It provides a lens, if you will, into the possible future that our people can make for ourselves. You know, it's interesting how you talked about the, the Nesby students who are African, but then the athletes are probably American. Yeah. The the best entertainers, all those things that are not centered around the sciences and the maths are not all. And I am generalizing it, mm -hmm. but we do that very well. We play sports very well here in the U.S. We provide some of the best entertainment that affects the entire world. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure that we show our children 
the images of all that we do, mm -hmm. all that we're capable of doing. The STEM, the science. Correct. Make it cool. Right. And I think, you know, we always talk about nerdy, and I, I'm i really, really irked that if you're into that geeky stuff, that you're acting white. I hated that. I've always hated that growing up. Like, if you had an interest in anything sciencey, that's dorky. And I think that one of the things that is broken down by Afrofuturism is that it's cool. Like, right. straight up, it's dope to see, you know, a black samurai, you know. Afro well, samurai. Afro, I'm saying, we know it. It's dope. Or, yeah. or, like you said, Outcast. The dude, Andre 3000, it was, there was gangsters and everything, and this dude is wearing shoulder pads mm -hmm. on a bus. Like, he's wearing shoulder pads. Like, he, his style was different than everyone. And it's, like, celebration of difference. And it's also a celebration of, as you said earlier, like, the, we want to make sure that it is actually, not say cool, I don't want to be generic or cool, but it should be celebrated in a sense of STEM. Like, that there is a, you know, there's a special swag that comes with intellect, too. Right. It's right. so almost like a celebration of the possibilities of what we can do when we put our minds to it. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, we can just look at the things that we've already created, mm -hmm. you know, so we can talk about the history that exists. And what's interesting to me, because I wanted to mention a few more individuals when we talk about artists, because I talked about musicians, but artists that represent that subculture, pop culture, whatever word you want to use. Um, we have Joshua Mays, Krista Franklin. These are artists. Tyra White Meadows, uh, Wangichi Mutu, Komi Olaf, uh, Mishindo Kuumba. Those are artists, meaning they create art, visual mm -hmm. art or painting. Mm -hmm. And you have Ellen Gallagher, Cyrus Kaburu, and I don't know if a lot of people remember um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. I don't know why I heard that name before. If I recall correctly, I remember seeing the movie, and I think Jeffrey Wright played him. And he was this brilliant artist and had some ties to Warhol, I believe. But okay. his his art was so different, and but it caught on quick, and it was just amazing it was gritty it was definitely not what everyone else was used to but that brother actually created something that was astonishing and you know back in the 70s and the 80s anything that was different that by us wasn't necessarily viewed to be mm -hmm. the best but i just wanted to mention some of those artists uh, when we talk about writers you know we have um, Ishmael Reed, we have Octavia Butler, who is like really, really big when it comes to that genre. Then you have some others, like um, I mentioned Samuel R. Delaney. That brother has written so many books in and around that subject area, but his name doesn't get mentioned very often. Um, Nidhi Okotafor, N.K. Jemison, Nalo Hopkinson, Colson Whitehead, William Hayashi. When I checked on William Hayashi, not that these are all African Americans per se, because but, saying, yeah. but the topic that they're writing about with William Hayashi, he created a, a story around what if there was a colony on the dark side of the moon, okay. and that colony was populated with black people. Oh, okay. So if, can you imagine, you know, there's always people that say, like, there's no real space out there or anything like that. We only see one side of the moon, like we can't really travel there. So this story kind of puts in your mind black people in space before we were really getting there. So I just thought it was quite interesting. I wanted to let your listeners know about just the different areas that represent the topic that we're speaking about. Yeah, about science and science fiction with black people. Correct. That's, and, and I don't know, just as cool. I think it's always been cool when I watch comic books and stuff 
that eventually over time I definitely gravitated. I mean, they weren't my favorite characters, but it was still cool to see. Like, I'm a big uh, Marvel comic fan. That's not, but it was always cool to see Bishop. It was. I was like, dang, they got Bishop, the dude from the future. He got a big M on his face, you know, like, mm-hmm. but he was a black dude. And then seeing Black Panther, but then it was cool to just see over time, you know, like uh, Static Shock. Right. Or, uh, you, know, when, you know, the Black Lightning dude. Just more people of color represented in a genre that I liked. Right. And that was that was what. And then I think, as you said earlier, it's just every expression of art, popular art, has had an influence by people of color. But it wasn't really highlighted as much in the sci-fi genre of artistic showing. Right. But now with this, and I'm not saying a new wave, but just this, this, uh, this culture, I think it's just great to have that. I don't know. I think, I think we're just going to court. I think we should, the thing that the pop culture speaks to reality is that it, you know, there is the hard work and, you know, for me, I, I ain't going to lie. I think math is boring. I hate math. It's boring for me, but I think it's just great to see, that, that that there are people, all kinds of different people that do math. Right. <laughs> like, there's there's people, there's all kinds of different people. When you go to the engineering building at a university, there's all kinds of different people doing engineering. And and then you see them, you know, and, and I just think it's different spaces. Uh, there's diversity in every space. And people getting, you know, praises for that. Right. And also... We, I really want to break down that, you know, if you're already a minority in a certain space, let's say you go to a new office, right? Mm-hmm. That's already hard enough. But then to feel like you're already not, not say welcome, but you feel odd in that space. But then you go back to your own people and you feel odd in that space. Right. That sucks. <laughs> so like, why, why can't you feel like if you're going to feel odd in that space where there's not a lot of people like you, why can't you go back to the space where people are like you and they say, yo, we we're proud of you for venturing off into that space. Meaning like, okay, like you, you got someone that's studying STEM and they're really, you know, busting their butt and they probably don't fit in with all the kids, you know, in their classes, but then they go home and then people call them a nerd. Like you, it should be like more celebrated. Like, wow, you're doing, you're breaking barriers. You're doing things that hopefully more people are going to come after you. Right. And do those things. But that's our that's the job of the community mm-hmm. to continue supporting those who are making strides in the area less traveled. Yes. And I will try not to be offended as a math teacher. Oh, you know. So bad about math. Well, you know, you got me. I remember. I remember earlier you asked me a math question, and I failed that one miserably. You did, but it's okay. Like you asked me what was better, square root or times, and I I don't know if I just like I don't know. I, think square root and it was like exponentially worse you know it's quick it was like quick math too i like it was on the spot it was but it's okay i'm a i'm a, I'm a historian i can write papers it's fine i teach mathematics i i love it it's the best job in the world but when i hear someone talk about mathematics i always think of the simple saying math is how science justifies what it wonders yeah i agree with that so okay so how about this i like i don't like math as in don't like like that disrespect to the subject i like math that i can do like i like um i do like numbers but i like i like numbers like uh like i nerd out on the um statistics of my podcast and then i do numbers and i do averages and then how much average right so that is math but it's not like um it's not like hard like I am doing physics and telling you like I'm not drawn on a board and has the whole formula to get to one number. I'm just doing something like real quick so I can make a graph. Well I agree with so you. So maybe that's I'm like on that level either. So maybe that's like elementary math. Okay, elementary math or, or visual math. If you are good with the statistics, then that's where you lie. I mean I'm a teacher of mathematics. What's your favorite kind of math? My favorite, I believe, I can say honestly, is algebra. So the difference for algebra is like the mini, the middle thing, like this. If you 
plus x equals this, and you have to figure out what the x. That's algebra. Geometry is more like the shapes. And space. And space. And then physics is more like movement and how this got to this and force. Right. And then statistics is averaging and standard deviations and stuff. I don't even know what trigonometry is. I just remember I took it. Trig. It's like sine and cosine. I'm just literally throwing out things that I was supposed to know in high school. So that you're I doing a pretty decent job. That I remember some of it. And then calculus. Don't even. I don't even remember. I took pre-calc, and I don't even remember anything I studied in pre-calc because we had to take that. At, if you're a business major, you had to take pre-calc. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a standard math. But it's okay though because all of those courses taught you how to think about things critically yeah. and how to solve for the unknown. That's true. I, I think that's okay. So I do appreciate mathematics with the combination of like, if you want to figure out why like this got to this point in this time, you use a math equation. Absolutely. If you want to. And even though I get asked every year about how am I going to use this math in my everyday life? Well, just tell them the paycheck one though. That works. Well, that's the easiest one to do. Yeah, you had to use math for paycheck. But when they start asking you, you know, different questions, how is math related to the window and all of those things? And it it starts to get very interesting when you start talking above the students' heads when you really are trying to let them know that there's math everywhere in the world all over. Well, I mean, true. If you're a construction worker, you need to know math to do measuring of the of your contracting if you're architect so i mean math okay I, I i think i just convinced myself that i like it a little bit but it's still very it's probably for some people that doesn't come naturally i think it's generally the hardest thing for a lot of people i'll give you that like writing a paper was easy for me talking in front of people is easy if you had me doing math problems it's like long and doing a math problem to me was a lot easier. Yeah. And writing the paper took a lot of effort. Yes, see, it was flip flop. Okay. So I think there's left brain, right brain. But we can, you know, so this my, we go on tangents. But the main thing I did take from all this is that we're celebrating these subjects. Afrofuturism, per se, celebrates these subjects. It talks about the future, it talks about where we can go with technology. It, um, it creates worlds that have already been created, but just not us in them. <laughs> you know, like there's worlds out, like there's worlds like you know the elves and Lord of the Rings and all that. But you don't, you really don't see any. I mean, I think I saw Harry Potter. There were some black kids at that school in Hogwarts. Nobody major though, huh? I don't think there was a major character in Hogwarts that was black, right? I'm sure, it wasn't. Or Lord of the Rings. None that I saw that stood out. Okay, I'm trying to think of some other ones just to keep going down the list. Star Wars, Lando. I <laughs> yeah, Star Wars. And Lando. Lando Calrissian. That's it for Star Wars. That was it until this new group and you saw um, the guy, what is it, Boyega is his real name. Oh, well, yeah, the new Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Flynn. He was Flynn. 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 Okay. Um, and then um, Star Trek always had black people on it. They did. I like uh, what's it called deep, uh, deep, uh, not deep space nine when it was on a space station. Commander Cisco, right? That was pretty cool. I actually liked that one the most because it was Commander Cisco. But I enjoyed watching Star Trek from back in the day because of Michelle Nichols playing Lieutenant. Ooh. Yeah, but as you're saying, I think now we're f as we're moving forward. Now it's, it's there. It's just they're showing. Uh, in science fiction, the world. So there's more like gay and lesbian people in science fiction. There's more black people. They're showing the diversity that should have always been in the future. Because surprise, surprise, if we're going in the future from this point, there's going to be diversity in space. Um, you know, in space station in 30, 30,000, 30, whatever, there's probably going to be so many people mixture that there's really not going to be that, you know, I don't know. Just saying, if we're thinking the future, they're using... I think the problem with science fiction and when it was written is they're talking about the future, but their authors were writing from their current perspectives. So, while they're talking about the future, there, were segre there was segregation. Right. So, like, while they're thinking the future, they're like, well, of course, in this future, it's still white-only uh, restrooms. You know, like, they, they're picturing... 
their current state to write about the future. So I think that's why this movement started a little bit later, as you said, in like the 90s, because it's more representative of like things are getting broken down now. Barriers are getting broken down currently. Right. And then we're going we're gonna to express those barriers being broken down currently when we do uh, uh, stories of the future. Right. Now, again, the, the whole idea has been around a lot longer, but as yeah. far as an actual name to it, that's okay. That's that's what Mark Berry did. Okay, he got he, he attached a name to what George Clinton and Parliament was doing. Yes, he attached a name to what Jimi Hendrix was doing. Right, he because was doing. when he played his music, it was otherworldly. It was no one could really figure out how he was able to do the things that he would do. I was about to say drugs, but no. <laughs> but yes, drugs do. They're they're powerful. Yes, but 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 there was Ali Rosley. But yeah, they were. It was different. It was different, and it took people on trips. And think about um, just the seventies, the way that yes. um, they dressed, mm -hmm. they they portrayed characters, mm -hmm. and even the music that they created sounded otherworldly. It did so. George Clinton, at that time, he was one of many that was dressing the way that they were dressing mm -hmm. and creating music. So we just didn't have a name. We called it funk back then. Yes. But the whole subculture got mm -hmm. its name, and now that's what we know it as. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a great thing to have a name attached to a culture that represents your viewpoint. Um, I use the term a black lens. You know, what would sci-fi look like if I had black lenses? Mm -hmm. Where I was able to see um, an entire science fiction mm -hmm. novel that deals around African Americans or Africans and their stories. And those stories exist, which is a great thing because now our children can mm -hmm. read about possibilities or, or stories that include characters that look like them. Yeah, dope. Which I, is what important representation. I mean, I, I mean, I think that's why, and we're going to go back to the original thing that we talked about at the very beginning of this episode, why Black, like Black Panther was uh, not just a comic book movie for people. It was like a cultural American movie for people. Because it was a phenomenon. It was a phenomenon because just to see the kids so excited that I think that's what you really spoke to us. I think that was the coolest part of the whole thing was the kids dressing up in black Panther mask and saying, I could be a superhero too. Right. And, uh, you know, like one of my favorite things, I mean, I know it's not black planter related, but my son loves now that new Spider-Man because he loves seeing miles Morales right. doing something. And I just think that's so cool. Like I could be this, I can be a hero too. So I think it's yeah. Black Panther was a phenomenon, not just because of the future, but the thing that you said that came out was representation. That representation in that space was just so important. I think it was more important for the kids than anyone else. I mean, I loved it, but I think just seeing the kids rally around it, they that's really what took it to the next level for me. And I think the other thing that was so important was it was one of the first times I saw adults coming out dressed in mm -hmm. traditional African attire, wherever they were able to obtain it, they were, you know, doing cosplay and showing up. Mm -hmm. or they were just creating their own look, which was supposed to be a representation of, you know, a tribe or um, a group of people. And it seemed as if everyone was proud to come out and walk whatever carpet they had, because there were so many red carpets and I remember seeing the, the video that people were um, dancing to mm -hmm. um, to the music but that all stemmed from the movement that was Black Panther which was a representation of Afrofuturism. Yeah. yeah. And we also talked about some other ones that highlight like Afro Samurai was dope. I feel like the... Will always be dope. Yeah, I feel like the um, genre uh, it's like there's different pockets, like you know, steampunk. You hear that all the time about like this kind of like weird future, but slash p past thing. Right. But I think that in regards to a, a direct connection, I really, 
I mean, I think steampunk is cool and all that, but like, as I said earlier, I just keep on going back and forth. It's like when you have dreams and you daydream, right? Right. Like I pictured, I used to picture myself being a superhero and it's cool to have those daydreams and like I'm flying and do all that stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm driving a floating car and then it's like, okay. And then you see a movie and you're like, oh, well that was just a daydream. Like they don't have no one like me in those, those, that space. But then now it's like, okay, I daydream about it, but then I see people like me in it. I was like, okay, that's cool. That's even cooler. <laughs> you know, like, like, okay, I can, I can fly the Millennium Falcon, you know? Right. right. And I think. It, it as it pulls toward it's like what really really stands out about all this is that even though in this fiction this is fiction this afrofuturism thing and music and culture it it drives re- real creati- creativity and creation so while we're daydreaming and fantasizing about the future it inspires you to do real things in the present like it inspires you to really in your present moment, study STEM. Like uh, I, I used to daydream about this, but I'm going, I'm going to now bust my ass and go to MIT, and I'm gonna study engineering and robotics. And, and it is a true possibility for me to do that. Yeah, because, exactly. Because I've seen mm-hmm. the, the possibilities, and that's what mm-hmm. um, science fiction has always done. It gave us mm-hmm. a a view of what the future could be like. So the importance of Afrofuturism is to provide that lens for kids to kind of see themselves in this science fiction or to be inspired enough to create a light bulb that runs on water. Yes. Because the village doesn't have electricity lines. And that does actually exist. Yeah. There was a, um, an African girl who wanted to find a solution to the electricity problem in her village, her area. So she created a light bulb that runs off of water. Right. And then you told me, you said you saw some young kids that actually did something with 3D printers. Absolutely. Right. That whole 3D printing technology has just taken the world by storm. And just watching these young men in my Summer Literacy Academy program during the STEM workshop, they're designing their own 3D models. I don't think that they're totally aware of what it can create, but with it, them knowing that mm-hmm. whatever they create, that 3D printer will print it out. It has to be a connection for them somewhere. I truly and honestly believe, like, if they can make something that they design their, themselves and it gets printed out, just imagine what else that they could print. Yeah, and then, like you say, that, like, maybe it's just the connection and the fact that they believe they can do it. That's the, the best part about the whole thing is that through a fictional lens creates a reality in a belief that you can, it's a possibility. I think that's why I love, that's why I think anyone loves science fiction. It, it's like, okay, maybe this is so far fetched. Like we're living on other planets and all this stuff. Right. But then at the very bottom of it, it's like, okay, but whether it's 50 years from now or 20 years from now, or maybe even just five d- days from now or whatever, things have created where things that we used to think were only in science fiction have actually come true. It, it just the uh, the timetables all like obviously we watched the movie Back to the Future and it's not look looks like what it is in that movie when you went and and the sequel one right like we're not really completely doing it but on the flip side if you watch that movie they've made a checklist of things that they actually we are doing that is from that movie right. so I think you're right like that connection of like okay they you might minimize it like that, that's the craziest part too it's like for us. We were like, wow. They're, we watch Back to the Future. And we're like, wow. They really, they're really talking to each other, video chatting. That's right. crazy. Right. These kids now, they just that's that's their existence. They just they didn't th- they don't think that's crazy. Not at all. <laughs> like, they use their technology all, all the time. time. Yeah, like they my kids FaceTime all the time, and I'm just pay phone is. I just yeah. So it's that's 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 what this is. I think that you know the. The John, the you say the John, the future has always been. People have always looked at the future, and every single historical thing, people talked about the future. That's what we do. We 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 always look ahead to what we can do in advance. Fantasize and daydream about what could be, and then make it happen. Though make it happen. But I think now is that we're. 
we've always had black inventors. I was thinking like I was just like randomly popped in my head. The uh, stoplight, right, was by Morgan, right? I believe that is Garrett cool. Morgan. Garrett Morgan, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, at, at that moment, I don't think he would think he was some futuristic person. He was just making a stoplight. He was. He saw a problem. Yeah. And he wanted to fix it, and that was one of a few things that he did. Yeah. So like. But at that moment, I think that's how technology and that future thinking thinks. In the moment, you don't think you're really doing big stuff. But he probably was inspired by something, some fiction or something that he read or something that he thought was a possibility. Right. And so I think that's how it works. And I think that's why encouraging people to, you know, get into math and science, no matter if you even care about it. Like, I'm a history major. Right. I love I love actually, I, I may not want to be an inventor myself, but as a history major, I love to study history, historically, people in the past that made big things like okay. that. You know, I love the old study of technology. So it's like, there's always a way to appreciate these subjects. And I think that even in this, the Af- I think that even Afrofuturism gives a, a like a shout out to the past as well. You know, okay. like, cause Absolutely. when I'm, because when I'm thinking of the Afrofuturism, okay, so here's the thing though, that gives allusion to the past is that when you watch Black Panther, right? And they talk about technology, Wakanda, all this stuff, right? They still give reference to old African culture, tribes, right? Uh, battles, uh, challenging people. I'm pretty sure that really did happen. You know, if you want to be the boss of a tribe, you, you fought for it. And I'm pretty sure that there was kings and queens. I mean, these the hierarchy system. So it's like an infusion of traditions. Customs and traditions. Yeah, customs and traditions in a futuristic lens. Right. So I think that's also pretty dope too, because with that, that's that's the another part is that for us to look into the future, though, we're still incorporating some historical context or some cultural context. Absolutely. I I like how the movie in itself gave you a glimpse of what a unified people could be like and could accomplish, Mm -hmm. but they never let go of the customs and traditions Mm -hmm. that existed and kept them grounded. So from, from the clothing that they wore that Mm -hmm. represented um, historically different tribes, the headdresses represented different areas to the architecture of the buildings that were Mm -hmm. in the sets. All of those things gave reference to the past. But they still had huts. They still had huts, but then they had lasers. Or not lasers, but like rocket, you know, like proton cannons or whatever you call them. I don't know. But they had like, they had technology. The dude was riding rhinos, but then they had lasers. It was like, that's crazy. Right. It, It was crazy. But it's also like, badass to be yes. able to do that both you, you might you live low tech but you have high tech technology to use yes. for yourself yes not even that not only that but to to know that you needed to live in seclusion in order to continue to flourish yeah. because you because they knew that people would want to acquire the technological advances that they made so beyond the, I guess Black Panther is the place marker for this. Is there any other major movies that we can think of that like exhibits this? We we did the cartoon, we did Afro Samurai, we did we did um, Black Panther. But is there any other thing like for someone that just wants to get into it? Is there anything else that comes to mind that you've seen recently? Well, it's interesting that you ask that because I do remember um, as a kid seeing the movie um, The Brother from Another Planet. That was mm. by John Sales. Okay. And I I remember I always remember this brother playing that particular role. So if you recall seeing the seeing the show Scandal. Yes, Scandal, okay. Yeah, Daddy Pope. Yes. Daddy Pope, Father Pope, Olivia Pope's father. Yeah. He played the brother from another planet in that movie. Because it's a movie it's an old movie, like the eighties. Okay. Seeing it. And that was one of the first um, glimpses that I had of seeing a black person that was from another planet with amazing powers, 
didn't do a lot of speaking, but I think the the, the movie itself had. I'm um, gonna check that one out though. Impact. It's an old one, but it was good because I mean it kind of freaked me out because there was this um, moment where he pulled his eye out and the eye could see things or record things, <laughs> what? and he could put it back in to see or to help other people to see. But it's interesting when I think about all of the sci-fi shows yeah. that I that I've seen over the years that represent Afrofuturism. Yes, I'm saying that's referring to. Now I'm trying to look for it. Yeah, that movie um, comes to mind a lot, but it's not that many. I know. So I'm trying to think of a list because I saw that when I looked it up on Wikipedia, there wasn't like a crazy list. So whether I mean it's not really existing as much, or it's like you said, it's pockets. But I guess they like said the hallmark of it, like the epitome, the embodiment of it was Black Panther. But I'm trying to think, you know, just for people that want to going like different things um well i think if they started um of course if you're going to google afrofuturism and tie that to movies that'll probably will bring up quite a few i think as i was preparing for the podcast that was the one thing that i kind of overlooked i have one movie which i readily identify with but outside of black panther i don't recall any others that stood out like really really stood out there's a lot of music, though. Oh, I definitely can find songs and music. Well, like know, I said, we got people, cast. We we know music in and out. We're always progressing musically mm. while others are picking up what we've created. Yeah, remember that joke? Remember the Janet Jackson and Michael Jackson video together? Scream. Scream. That was, like, pretty futuristic. That was, that was crazy. Yeah. Well, Michael Jackson is, was always pushing the envelope in his projection yeah. and presenting a different um, lens yeah. of how we could get along or he was never really the focal point all the time even though yeah. he was for making music but he was always thinking about the future yeah he was thinking about the future too yeah so he was and like yeah the moonwalker the moonwalker was kind of weird did it ever turn into a car? That was kind of futuristic. It was. Like Moonwalker. If you walk, I really don't even know the plot anymore. I, I, don't, I don't either. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows that can tell you the plot. He turned into a car, then he turned into a big robot, right. and he fought Danny DeVito, which I don't know why Danny DeVito was the bad guy in that movie. I don't you know? know, but he plays such a good bad guy. Though. And then the, the end, and then he danced. That's Moonwalker. I literally just kind of did the synopsis of Moonwalker. You did, but I also played the video game. Yeah, it is for Sega Genesis. Yep. Oh, and, but the it was a arcade game. I don't remember the arcade. Game. I remember. I'm at a Sega Genesis game. I'm a little older than you. Yes, little, just little. Mm-hmm. So we're at the part. We're at a good point of the same. We're at the part where we call it shot for shot of the podcast. Meaning, we you know we could drink alcohol or we could like we normally do for shot for shot. As you get to ask me any question that you want, and I get to ask you any question I want. And it probably is, when I case shot for shot, it don't even have to be related to this. It could be anything. Um, I don't know. Do you want to go first? I go first. Uh, this is new to me, so you go first. Okay. So, you went to HBCU. Yes. If you can go back in a time machine and go to... Uh, I'm going to give you two choices. If you can go back to the time machine and go to... Three other HBCUs, or th- and three different, predominantly white schools, PWIs. What would those other three and three be? So six schools, and tell me why, and tell me if it's because you study something or it's near the beach or whatever. So basically, just in a Saint. Oh God, here it go. Saint Augustine, Augustine, Saint Augustine. Dad, why do you? I, who said, is there two different schools? One is St. Augustine and St. Augustine? St. Augustine is in Florida. Are they spelled the same? It's spelled the same. Why do they do that? Well, I don't know. Okay. different St. Augustine and St. Augustine. Right. But if you can go back in the time machine, mm-hmm. three and three. Um, so, three HBCUs that I would mm-hmm. have wanted to go to. One would have been Howard. Okay. Which I didn't choose to go to because I didn't want to. You got in though. Band. Got in. Okay. The other one would be Morehouse. Uh, that I was, wouldn't want to go to Morehouse. That was my one of my three. And then I think the third one would probably, probably, 
Tuskegee. Okay, but you didn't say any rival, right? So you didn't get in trouble there. No, it's like you didn't say like one other school that you would have rivaled. Okay, so. closest rival to Saint Aug would be Shaw, but it's not no really contest between them. Oh, okay, is it no contest on your side? No, not on my side. Saint Aug is better than Shaw. Okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Lamarcus, you heard that here first. <laughs> he's he's Mr. Shaw too. He is. He's forty for forty. That's our joke. You know the, the forty under forty mm-hmm. when they you know the Mr. Alumni. I'm 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 if I'm if they do a thousand for a thousand at <laughs> JMU. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. So, but okay. So that's those are the three HBCUs. Okay. What about the PWIs? PWIs. Um, I would. I would have wanted to go to. NYU. In New York, yeah, that's dope. I would have wanted to go to I would have wanted to go to Stanford. Okay, yeah. And then I really would have wanted to go to Oxford. Okay, yeah. That's pretty dope. Yeah. Oh, that's a good three. And just because you want to go abroad. To go abroad. All right. Okay, now. You got mine. Okay, so I just get to ask you a question. Yeah. So, if you weren't doing what you do now, dream job, what would it be? Oh, that's easy. I do this all the time. I mean, it'd basically be like Anthony Bourdain slash... Andrew Zimmerman slash doing this podcast. I mean, I travel the world. I talk to people that are famous or not famous, just interview people and, and eat. eat. Food. And delicious food, both. Come on, Zimmerman eats like animals. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I would do both. That are alive. Yeah, I do that. Okay. I watch the show. I watch Bizarre Food and I say I can eat everything that he eats. You can? Yes. Oh, no, I could. I, I can. I've eaten eyeballs, brains, all that. Eyeballs. Yeah, I've taken the. I've gotten. I went to a pig roast. I took the eyeballs out of the pig for the pig roast and ate it. Okay. And they brain. You got it, bro. So, but I would do that because I mean, I think that's one of my my dreams would be to, look, and I, don't, I mean the world to country, but it'd be like I would have the podcast podcast ready, meet new people, talk to them, interview them, and then we'd have a meal and then eat different and it'd be like i mean not just crazy stuff too like right. it'd be sometimes crazy stuff sometimes it'd just be the we are in we're in texas so we're gonna eat the best texas barbecue we in kansas city we eat kansas city barbecue right we in chicago we eat in chicago style pizza or or the the um what's it called the steak not the, the cheese no the cheesesteak is philly but they got the other uh, beef they got the chicago beef in chicago i mean i would just eat different things that are representative of that place okay and then I would just drink a lot too. Okay. It'd be drinking in there too, like drinking places. Like so, basically, I would just be like, just let's say hedonistic or something, gluttony. Mm-hmm. But I would, but also talk to people at the same time. And hopefully, they can talk back to you. Or hopefully, and then I'd be healthy enough to like keep doing this without getting like type something diabetes from eating all this bad food. Type fifty diabetes. <laughs> yeah, because I, because you probably shouldn't be eating crazy because you know the guy that did um this is another tangent you know the guy that did um man vs food right he had to stop doing man vs food because his doctor told him he had to stop he should have known it already because he was doing all those challenges so if you watch a couple seasons later it's like community vs food where you have other people do the challenges right and now i think they've changed they swapped hosts out right there's someone else doing it yeah because he could i mean that's bad it's bad for you it had to be. but i would do that as a dream job okay or then I, maybe I just do. I, I mean, I would just. Enter. I would love to just meet people, famous or not famous, and just talk to them and learn their stories and do this. I would love to do this all the time. Like a podcast for the people. Traveling. Traveling. Traveling podcast. A traveling podcast. That's an interesting concept. Yes, and get paid for it, and uh, be my that'd be my nine to five. Maybe yeah, one maybe one day. one day. All right, so we're at the end of the episode. This is what we call uh, shout outs and plugs, meaning that there's anything that you want the listeners to know, or you want to do shout outs to people, but also when I say plugs, like if you have any ventures, 
like for instance your camp and all those things but this podcast i'll let you know is going to be in the future because i'm taking a podcast break <laughs> so this is coming after august 5th but any shout outs and plugs maybe for the camp next year or anything that you're working on the stage is yours um end out wherever you want but shout outs and plugs all right so i definitely want to shout out all the kids young boys young girls that will be participating in the arlington public schools summer literacy academy for the summer of 2019 knowing that they're going to enjoy themselves i also want to shout out the students who promoted to ninth grade from Gunston Middle School. Um, shameless plug for the algebra team at the school as well. They were the best. Um, definitely want to shout out a good friend of mine, Mr. Ola Aladapo, who's all the way in Johannesburg. Good friend of mine. I actually want to shout out the people in Johannesburg. Definitely enjoy myself whenever I go there. The people are nice. The food is good, plentiful, and not very expensive from an American's point of view. Uh, definitely want to shout out my mom's because she is the best and she is the reason that I'm able to do what I'm doing now. That's Dr. Lorraine. Corey Moore. Uh, I want to shout out my daughter, Ayani, Reese Hyman. And yes, I said your entire name, government. I definitely want to shout out those who know about the golden time of day. If you're a Maze featuring Frankly, Frankie Beverly fan, you'll know what that means. My daughter kind of hit me to that. Oh. So the golden hour is the best time for you to take a selfie because that's when your melanin is popping the most. But it basically equates to like sunset. Oh, okay. So I'm going to do it. I'm about to do one. Uh, I want to shout out the Gamma Psi chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, um, Mission Impossible, all my line brothers that are present and that have transitioned. That would be Solomon Grundy, number 13, and 31 Flavors, number two, Miss You Dearly. And um, I think that's about it. Well, that's been great. That was actually a really, I learned something, even on your shout out, I learned to do something new. So Hyman, you're always an educator. You're a teacher, even when you're not trying to teach. So now I'm going to try to take a selfie at that time. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. This has been great. Hopefully this, the listeners learn something. They look forward to the future. Like we're looking forward to the future. Absolutely. And hope you listen to more episodes. Right. Thank you. Over and out. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening.